the Instructor Podcast with Terry Cook, talking with leaders, innovators, experts and game changers about what drives them. So welcome and thanks for joining me today on Season 2, Episode 3 of the Instructor Podcast. Came back from a bang last week with a couple of cracking episodes and we're back again today with another terrific episode in Carl Reader. Um, I'll let you find out more about Carl when we come to him, but he's offering us a wealth of advice around small businesses and in particular driving schools in how we can develop and almost future-proof our business going forward. I do appreciate you joining us. If you want to share the love, make sure you click subscribe or follow wherever you're listening. Give it a share on social media. Tell your friends about it. All that kind of shizzle. You'll have my eternal gratitude. We've also got some straight, great stuff going on in the, the background behind the scenes over on Patreon. So feel free to go over and take a look on Patreon. You can find the links in the show notes and on all my social media stuff as well. Have a nosy over there. But for now, we're going to kick off with the interview with Carl Reader. <music> Okay, so welcome to the Instructor Podcast. Today I am joined by the wonderful Carl Reader. He's author, business expert, and podcaster, who I only recently discovered, but I'm very, very happy I have because I'm getting some real insights already. So welcome to the show, Carl. Thanks for joining us. How are you today? Hey, Terry, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I'm on a high after um, England winning. So we're recording this the day after England beat Denmark. And I guess I'm just hopeful that that luck that England had carries on. Yes, whatever you were doing last night during that game, you need to make sure we repeat on Sunday. Um, yeah, but definitely it was a, it was a good game. I enjoyed watching. It. I'm not the biggest football fan. Uh, I kind of tend to dip in and out, but yeah, it's definitely definitely coming home this time. I'd say. Um, but back to you then. Uh, the first thing I like to ask people is rather than me talk about the person that's coming on the show, I like to ask the person. So could you just tell us a bit about yourselves, a bit about your background, your history, and and, and what you're up to now? Yeah, of course, Terry. So um, it, it's quite humbling to hear the phrase business expert because. I certainly didn't set out to be a business expert in any way, shape or form. I fell into the business world completely by accident and without wanting to go back to the point where the midwife held me up by my feet. Um, what I will do is go back to uh, being of school age and at the age of 15 and three quarters, and this will show my age now, when I got my national insurance card, I decided to leave school before my GCSEs and did a YTS in hairdressing. Now, that didn't work out. And went back to school, muddled through, completing the GCSE exams, and um, had to work out what to do next. So I fell into a career in accountancy. And from there, what, what I realized was that I don't like accountancy. I, I, I don't particularly like accountants. I don't particularly like numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I loved about it was that it afforded me the opportunity to speak to business owners. It allowed me to ask them about their businesses and to learn on the job. So over time, you know, from speaking to one, two, three, four, five business owners, it, it soon became 10, 20, 30, 100, 200, 300. And with the benefit of youth, I mean, bear in mind that I went into this world at the age of 16, most would go after university at the age of sort of 21, 22. And most would spend a fair few years behind the desk before speaking to people. So I, I was actually um, able to embrace the naivety of youth and ask those stupid questions that actually the 30-year-olds wished that they could. I was able to carry it off because I was a, I was a cheeky youngster. So over time, what, what happened? You know, as it went from one, two, three to the tens to the hundreds to the thousands of business owners that I spoke to, I realized that there was a shift from me asking them questions to understand what they were doing and why they were making decisions that they did, to me asking questions to clarify and find opportunities to share with them the stuff that I'd learned from all of the other questions. So that, I guess, was the tipping point where I, I came to this um, yeah, business expert or, or whatever it's called. Anyway, to, to fast forward to where I am now, along the way, I bought my business out, scaled it up to a multi-million turnover firm, and then stepped away from it. Um, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to write three books, so the Startup Coach and the Franchising Handbook, um, followed by Boss It, my most recent book, which has thankfully been charting in WH Smith for the last six months. 
And what I've tried to do throughout my um, career, I guess, Terry, so since about 2012, 2013, when I started stepping away, is to give back to the next generation as much as possible. So I've tried to give back both from a poverty alleviation perspective. Um, I, I didn't have the I didn't have the most salubrious of upbringings, but yeah, it certainly wasn't bad. But it weren't, it, you know, it was a normal um, upbringing. But also enterprise education. So um, I do that through my books, uh, through my work with young enterprises as a trustee, um, but also through my newspaper columns, so on and so forth. Awesome. Um... You've made some really sort of key points here, and there's a lot of stuff I want to touch back on. Uh, but I think just sort of the thing you finished on there about stepping back from your businesses, because I was uh, reading up a little bit, and uh, one of the things I, that I read on, I think it was on your LinkedIn profile, was that um, you've got no executive involvement in your businesses. Why did you take that decision? Is that so you could spend more time to give back, as you put it? Or was there another reason there? Or yeah, sure. So, um, Terry, I'm going to give you the honest answer rather than the LinkedIn flannel that most people would give you. Right. Um, you know, most people would say that it's for some higher aim and some higher purpose. But intrinsically, most of us are lazy, aren't we? And <laughs> most of us have that dream of retiring on a beach. Um, now, I had that dream. I had the dream of stepping away and the belief that actually I would be able to down tools and do what I want and not feel any compulsion to do anything. Well, I realized quite early on in that process, and when I say early on, I don't mean years, I don't mean months, I mean days, that actually I'm not the kind of person who can retire, unfortunately. So um, I always found that during the process of stepping away, and then when I completely stepped away, I had to find something to fill up the time. And it just so happened that I liked the sound of my own voice, Terry. So um, I started with the writing and, and so on. There were a couple of pivotal points that made me decide that I wanted to give back specifically for enterprise education. And they tended to focus on my own kids and the journey that they took. So my eldest son, Jordan, and he's now um, coming up to 23. And I saw the way that the academic system was failing him. I saw that he's you know, he's like me. He's, um, he's smart. He's got the gift of the gab. But... He's also as thick as two short planks academically. And I knew that A-levels and degrees wouldn't be right for him because they wouldn't reflect who he is and what he can do. They would actually just um, pigeonhole him into a, um, a route in life that wasn't necessarily correct for him. So I saw the way that he was being forced down the academic route rather than the vocational route when he was far more cut out to roll his sleeves up and get on with something. And I also saw it with my stepdaughter, who um, was remarkably engaged with Young Enterprise when they came into her school and did buy the challenge. So those were two pivotal points that made me think, you know what, there's this real disconnect between business studies that's taught at school and the reality of running a business. You know, whether it is a driving school or whether you're running a chain of driving instructors, you know, like BSM or whatever, uh, there's this disconnect between the theory that we learn at GCSE business studies which is but it's all about share prices and big glass buildings and so on. And the reality, which is it's about making enough money to put food on the table and hopefully having an enjoyable lifestyle. So I, I tried to cover that off with the content that I was putting out there. And what happened was in 2016, I think it was 2016, 2017, there was a, a realization that I had, but actually there was no real voice of small business in that there was nobody who was doing the, you know, the Martin Lewis job for small business and just translating it and not trying to sell anything at the end of it, just, you know, just, just trying to make it simple and trying to demystify some of the complex management theories and so on to real advice that people could take. So, so that was kind of what I filled up my time with. But um, just to share a, another story, and I guess this will show that I had no defined route of what I was going to do when I exited the business and also to show the boredom that kicks in. I formally stepped away from the business in January 2019, I think it was. Uh, by the time we got to April 2019, or it might have even been March 2019, I was agreed to take over a National League South Football Club. So I, I think that just goes to show you that whilst we might have this pipe dream of retiring and playing golf and you know, watching films all day or whatever it is we decide to do, actually the reality is completely different. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the things you mentioned there about uh, simplifying business, uh, I heard a great quote, I read a great quote from you, it was you try to put business in a language an eight-year-old will understand. And I think that's really relevant because, like you said, I look back to when I was at school and, and the business education I had at school. To be honest, I can barely remember it. It was, I can remember doing the yeah. lesson, but I don't seem to remember learning anything that actually helped. I don't mean to be too dismissive of school there, but it, there was nothing significant there because one of the things about becoming a driving instructor, and I've actually mentioned this on previous shows, is that you don't have a choice. You are self-employed. You know, there's no option there. Um, I mean, there could be. Someone could go and create the school that employs people now. But you, by default, you're running your own business. So I suppose that, that brings us back to, like you mentioned, the, the, the driving school side of it. So a question I like to ask my guests, especially the ones from outside the industry, is from the outside looking in, do you have like a, a preformed opinion on our industry, uh, whether that goes back to potentially times you've maybe learned to drive or times you've seen instructors on the road. Do you have a, a preformed opinion there? I do. So I, I'm actually going to rewind a little bit and just comment on um, the first thing you raised about uh, business being in a language that eight-year-olds can understand and um, to tie that into driving schools, because I think you, you've hit on a really relevant point that I want to call out there. Um, so look, one of the biggest problems with business in general, and we'll bring it back to driving schools in a moment, one of the biggest problems with business in general is that there are too many people out there who seek to overcomplicate it just so that they can charge for the solution. And, you know, you can understand that because it's a perfectly valid strategy, I guess, to start the war and then to sell the guns and then to sell the, sell the fix for it. You know, you can understand why people would do that. So... That's one of the challenges for business owners, whether drive, driving instructors right the way through to um, global PLCs. That's why they um, sometimes feel that things are being overcomplicated because there's a vested interest to do that um, by people who want to sell a fix. However, um, driving instructors, you're absolutely right, are business owners, but don't necessarily see themselves as business owners and are potentially accidental business owners. Um you know, we've all seen the rise of what's known as the gig economy. You know, um, we can look at Uber drivers, we can look at Deliveroo, we can look at um, this whole host of um, people who are actually doing what self-employed people have done forever and a day, which is embracing a more flexible way of working, uh, but still trading time for money effectively. So it, it's an interesting one. And I find that one of the problems that those communities have, so um, whether it is driving instructors or Uber drivers or delivery drivers or um, you know, Pimlico plumbers or whatever other gig economy role that it is, is that sometimes they're stuck in no man's land in that government believes that they should be employees, and they are employees, and most importantly, Terry, that they want to be employees and I actually don't believe most of them do want to be employees. I think that there's a mix. Some do, some don't. Some actually enjoy the freedom and the aspiration of doing something bigger than themselves. But then you have um, businesses and in particular, you know, the banks and so on, who don't see them as real businesses either. And they're kind of caught in this no man's land of being having an arm around their shoulder from an umbrella organization sometimes, but actually being left to their own devices. So I, I guess that brings me then nicely on to what do I make of the um, instructor industry and you know, how, how do I see it? I think that you know, I, can, I can reflect back on my own experiences of learning and I learned with um, two different instructors. I remember them both. I remember that they had different approaches, but they both fundamentally only um, were only able to earn a living based on the hours that they put in. Secondly, I remember, uh, bear in mind, I was, I, I mean, I hesitate to call myself a business expert now. I was by no means a business expert then. You know, I was um, I was 19 or 20. And um, what I did notice, though, was that they were all competing on price. At the time, I remember one of them was charging £20 an hour. The next one was charging £17.50 an hour. And 
you know, looking at looking back at that now with another 20 years worth of experience, I'm looking back and thinking, how on earth did you make minimum wage? How on earth did you pay for your vehicle and the fuel and the insurance and all of this, plus justify to your family that you were spending hours every evening, hours every day going out on the road doing this job? What I've seen since is that I think that, yeah, the, the current state of play, I think that there is still a vast proportion of driving instructors who do the trading time for money. However, I've noticed a few that are trying to branch out and trying to leverage and focus it as a business. And then obviously we've got the giants who try to um, sort of manage it as a platform rather than as a driving school. You know, they are a booking function rather than anything else. So there is all sorts. The future of the industry is what really interests and to some extent concerns me, though, Terry, because I'm not one of these people who think that we'll all be in self-driving cars within four years. However, I'm also a realist, and I know that the um, general direction of travel for innovation and the way that cars are going is that there will be an element of autonomy creeping in more and more and more. Um, we're already seeing some of that. You know, I know that my car can um, keep me in the lane. It can it can overtake, undertake. It can keep its distance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's got enough cameras and enough jiggly pokery under the dashboard to keep me relatively safe if um, if my attention drifts. Over time, that will develop. Um, I don't think it's an issue for today's generation of instructors, but it's definitely an issue for tomorrow's generation. Um, you're going to keep me on my toes in this episode because you've made so many brilliant points there that I want to touch back on. Um, and I'm going to touch back on the sort of the last one you made about the uh, the future of the industry. I think that, that's a real key point because, as you said, it's not like in the next few years that the driving's going to become autonomous, but it's going to start. And I think that the other thing that we're starting to see a change in now in terms of people learning to drive is that more and more people are delaying learning to drive, not just because of the past year or two with the, the pandemic, but even before that, more and more people are delaying learning to drive. You know, my average age for customer is 27. And, and part of that is because that's the, the, the niche I market towards, admittedly. But who would have thought that your average age of customer for a driving truck would have been 27? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the young kids that I teach now well, they're not paying for it. They tend to come from more well-off families who are paying for lessons and have their car ready for them. And that's not a slight on, on either section there. And so I think the people that are actually learning to drive are either, sort of gen, again, not everyone, not exclusively, but from the wealthier families, all even it's later on in life when they've got more money. So whereas we used to, as instructors, say, well, when you pass your test, you're going to buy a cheap car to begin with. I think that's starting to change. I think that now when you pass your test, more people are actually buying higher market cars, whether that's going for an electric car or something more autonomous, as you mentioned. Definitely. I, I think that's where the industry is going. Yeah, and I think that we've got a societal shift here as well, but we need to bear in mind in that we are in general moving towards more of a subscription economy. So this goes across the board. This goes from um, DVDs. You know, we don't we, we don't buy VHS tapes. We don't buy DVDs. We don't buy Blu-rays. We just stream on Netflix now. We subscribe. We don't own our music. We don't own. You know, we we own less and less. We've seen it in the automotive industry with the move from um, buying cash towards PCP. I don't know the precise percentage, but I know it's a significant percentage. I'm not say significant over ninety percent of cars are all on PCPs now rather than outright cash purchases. And undoubtedly, we've also seen the increase of use of you know, Ubers and I, I guess acceptance of the shared economy rather than the owned economy. So that's another challenge that's going to be creeping in and might in fact be the more pertinent issue than, um, than the fact that the cars themselves will be self-driving it might be more accurately referred to as the driver isn't driving, whether it's a computer doing it or an Uber driver. It doesn't matter. It's somebody else doing it. Having yeah. said that, I, I do think that there is a definite trend towards um, people enjoying driving, you know, savouring the real experience as well. 
And who who knows which direction this is going to go in? You know, we um, we always see trends every sort of five or six years of vinyl being very much in fashion. And who knows? There might be a resistance to autonomy. There might be a cachet in in actually having your car. Um, and I'm, I would come to the point of older drivers as well. I think that something I'm definitely seeing more of is that there's an aspiration from youngsters to live in a city that there wasn't before. But then there's also an aspiration after about five years of moving away. And when you move away from a city, you lose those shared um, benefits. You lose the fact that you can just call an Uber and it will be there in a minute. You lose the fact that there's a car club that you can jump into outside and you have to move into the world of car ownership. So it's an interesting time for the industry because it's moving. And I guess the, the wider industry just needs to move with it. Yeah. And again, another valid point, you know, I'm a really good case and example there in that I want to move to an electric car and I will do. And, and part of that is, is sort of personal reasons around the environment. Part of it is uh, there's an element of future proof in there. But I love manual. I love having a gear stick to use. That, to me, that's driving. That's what I enjoy. So I've kind of got a real... Uh, a real sort of thing to decide on the next four months. It's a, it's a conflict that so many people have. Um, I know that when I bought my last car, so I bought a car three months ago, and it was oh, it's really strange, by the way, Terry. It's really strange buying a car without seeing it. You know, I didn't. I it was during lockdown, so I wasn't able to open the door, let alone have a look round, let alone do a test drive. However, I had the choice between an electric car or a petrol car. And I've never been a petrol head, but like, but I ended up buying a BMW 840 and, you know, just going for that one, what I perceived was one last bit of fun. Now, will it be one last bit of fun? I don't know. I know that certainly the direction of travel from policy and um, le- legislative outlook is that it will all be electric cars. However, we also know that batteries aren't necessarily as sustainable as we would like and possibly might cause more damage than um, the depletion of fossil fuels. So will there be a new technology coming out soon as well? It, it, it's all a big unknown. But I think it's really important that we also ground ourselves in the reality of where we stand today. And the reality of where we stand today is that any reasonable assumption would show you that for the next 15 years, at least some people are going to be driving. Yeah. And I think the thing is as well, the one thing that won't change is even if we, when we do go, it might be 30, 40 years before we go full into, um, I like the phrase that you use, of not driving the car, but, um, we'll still need driving instructors because mm. you still need to be able to drive the car. So I think that the driving instructors will be the consistency there. and. That kind of brings me back to, to one of the other things you, you mentioned before. It's a point I definitely wanted to touch back on was you use the phrase trading time for money. And that just, it, it jars in my head, does that? Because it, it's a, a really realisation that that's what I've been doing for the past five years in this industry. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, if that's what someone wants to do, um, there's nothing wrong with that. But it really struck home during the, the lockdowns when we were told, no, no driving lessons are allowed to be delivered. And all of a sudden it was, ah, right. Well, I don't have an income then. And mm. and obviously I should have done something prior to that, but that's what's kind of kicked me into gear now with some 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 side projects that I'm doing. But we are just thrown into that that self-employed thing, that self-employed territory of the small business owner. And you know, in your book, Boss, that you talk a lot about at the start of that book um, about the difference between being self-employed, being employed, being a, an entrepreneur. And I thought there were some fascinating takes on that in there. So anyone that listening, by the way, make sure you check out that book, Boss, it's, it's a great book. I haven't finished it yet, so the ending might not be as good as a start, but it's definitely a good book. But- Thank you, Terry. I, I think um, one of the key things there that you mentioned about the difference between self-employment or business ownership, I, I just want to highlight that there's no right answer because some people want the entrepreneurial aspect of growing a business of scaling it of having a big team of having um you know ha- having that big responsibility on their shoulders other people want the ability to either earn more than they did in their job before they want to be able to work less hours 
They perhaps just want to choose who they work with. You know, there's, there's a number of different drivers and ev- everybody, I, I believe, should reflect on what their own individual drivers are rather than having to feel like or, or feeling like they have to conform to a societal norm. And you know, what, one of the problems we've had, I think, is the Dragon's Den apprentice generation of entrepreneurialism being seen as aspirational and being seen as attainable, when the reality is it involves a whole lot of luck, a whole load of broken relationships, a whole load of risk, a whole load of sleepless nights, and quite simply, not everyone's cut out for it. Not everyone wants it. So there is no right or wrong answer insofar as how you should run your business. Um, as long as it's the right answer for you, then it's the right answer. That's that's brilliant. That's essentially what um, this podcast has been about since day one. It's 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 giving people choices and options. Um, you know, whether that's speaking about coaching or marketing or or whatever else we've spoken about on the show. It's about giving people options rather than thinking they're set in a certain way. And I often use myself as the example because I think if if it's happened to me, it's happened to others. And when I first got into the industry and I was thinking, right, well, what more can I do? Everything that everyone said was quite simply, right, well, now you're an instructor, now you need to open the driving school and take on other instructors. And that's the route I started going down. And it was the wrong route because that's not right for me. I, I don't want to run a driving school, but there's other areas that I can influence, other things I can do. And I think that's really key. It's doing what's right for you. Um, and sort of on that topic, how would you, or what advice would you give to someone? So not necessarily a driving school, I suppose. I suppose it applies to anyone, but you're just starting out in business, you're, whether it's a driving school, whether it's you're open in a local shop, whether it's a, an entrepreneurial um you know business online or, or, or whatever what advice would you give to those people to make sure they're doing what's right for them rather than just following the the well-trodden path okay so the very first thing that i would suggest is that any potential or current business owner really reflects on their goals not just for their business but for themselves personally so really tries to get to the root cause of what, what it was that made them hand in their notice or you know, buy the website or whatever, whatever, they, you know, whatever tipping point there was, to really explore what that tipping point was. And then to make sure that what they're trying to do in their business actually is aligned to what they're wanting to achieve personally. Because there's one thing I can guarantee you, Terry, if, um, you know, let, let, let's just say you've got two dreams. You've got a dream of running a billion pound unicorn business. You know, the the kind of nonsense that we hear, you know, the gym sharks and so on of this world. You've got a dream of being this aspirational entrepreneur on one hand. On the other hand, you've got the dream of the so-called laptop laptop lifestyle, sitting on a beach in Bali, you know, tapping away on your laptop once a day and then soaking up cocktails and sunshine and so on. There's a brutal reality here that's often not told because both of those dreams are sold. But if personally you want to achieve one and professionally you want to achieve the other, the reality is that you will achieve neither because they're not aligned to each other. It's almost impossible to build that billion pound business whilst you spend all day sunbathing, drinking cocktails. And um, no no matter how many self-help gurus you follow on Instagram, no, no matter how many business books you read, no matter how many YouTube episodes you watch, the reality is that they're disconnected. So if we were to bring that down to a, a driving instructor, what, what I would strongly suggest is that they explore for themselves, why did they decide to become a driving instructor? You know, what was it that was more appealing about teaching than doing their job, whatever their job was before. What what is it that's more appealing? What yeah, you know, what were they looking from the role? Was it was it based on the flexibility of being able to work afternoons and evenings and being able to lie in, in the morning? Was it the fact they could take Fridays off? Was it because they had a highly higher hourly rate through doing it? Or was it through the ambition of growing a school? And when you really drill down to what it was that that started you on the journey, you know, what was the big dream that that compelled you to go against society's norm and hand in the notice and go out and do it. When you drill into that, that will then dictate what you should do with your business. 
Um, and the longer that you keep it misaligned and decide to develop it into a school with employed instructors or, or whatever route you decide to go, just because that's what other people tell you to do, the longer you'll be unhappy in your school. I wish I'd spoken to you three or four years ago. <laughs> um, back, I've only been doing this this uh, as an instructor about six years now. And one of the, the big reasons that I did it was um, to take control of, of my time so I could work when I chose to work rather than being dictated to. However, I then got my own business and worked more often and more unsociable I was than I was previously, which I think is a lot, uh, something that a lot of people, instructors and business owners, fall into. The, you know, they, they leave their job to have that flexibility and then take away their own flexibility by working hey. longer hours. This is absolutely right. Listen, let me tell you a couple of truths. Um, the first thing about self-employment is that you go from working for a jerk to working for a maniac. The second thing, the biggest benefit of self-employment, Terry, is that you get to choose which 18 hours per day you work. That's the reality of it. I love that. I've not heard that phrase before. You get to choose which 18 hours you work. I like that. Uh, I'll remember that one. Um, you also mentioned something before um, about we're talking about the your your instructors competing on price, and that still goes on in our industry. Unfortunately, uh, I, without being too critical of of the industry, I think that there's there's a lot of it that's still set twenty years ago, uh, and a, a big part of that is is price. Um, you know, I drive around all the time and, and I'll see people that are advertising, you know, 10 hours for this or first two lessons free or, or whatever it is. There's a competition there on, on price. And even for myself, again, I use myself as the example uh, a couple of years back when I, I started off from a national school and then I left. My first thing I was going to do was drop my prices below the national school's price. And I was actually through talking to a few different people that convinced me otherwise and, and put my prices back up. Um, what advice would you have for anyone there that's genuinely concerned about prices, about having competitive prices upwards rather than trying to build the lowest price in the market? So it's a tricky one because you need to put yourself in the position of the buyer. And I think there's two very clear markets that driving schools are approaching. The first is the youngster who's paying for it themselves. And the second is where the parent is paying for the youngster. I think that that's the two broad camps that we need to look at. And when we look at the student, you know, what is it that they're trying to achieve? They're trying to get their driving license as quickly as possible. Let, let's be honest, that, that's their end goal. And I, it's a belief of mine. I, you know, I don't know if it's who you'll be. You'll be by far the expert on this, but I believe that in if if people had the money to buy intensive courses and the instructors have the capacity to deliver intensive courses and, you know, we were able as humans to just drive day and night and, you know, just devote 24 hours to driving and you get your test at the end of the day, people would choose that. People would choose that because they value the speed of getting on the road and the excitement of doing it more than anything else. There is a slight difference in but when the parents are paying, I think the parents naturally want their children to be safe drivers. Going back to my 17, 18 year old self, safety wasn't my key priority when choosing a driving instructor. It was about speed and it was about cost. Um, I believe that instructors have to choose which market they're going after. And I believe the safer bet all round is the parent sponsored route not the um not the direct route if you're going for the very youngsters if you're going for older then obviously they are taking a more informed decision on their purchase and then to try it accordingly you know, you know when somebody's making a buying decision that's more informed and has got more factors there is then more value drivers within that decision so a parent or an older student would value things like um, even so far as the politeness of the instructor and cleanliness of the car, right the way through to the perception of um, thoroughness in the syllabus, et cetera, et cetera. There will always be a section of the market that wants it cheaper and quicker, and that's it. But the reality is that they're probably not the market that you should be aiming for. 
because not only are they the ones that are more expensive to reach and more difficult to persuade and convert because it's very easy to have three or four um, trial driving lessons and kick the tires. It's also very hard to keep them because they're the ones, if they've made their decision buying you on price, they're the ones who will then go to the next person on price. And they're the ones who ridiculously, and you know, it, it really is crazy, they will have more driving lessons and they will spend more money, but with 10 instructors doing five lessons here, five lessons there, five lessons there, rather than sticking to a program. So w- when it comes to pricing and positioning and so on, yeah, there, there's a whole play to it. And I'm no expert in this world, but I would be focusing on the right core of students who we want to be training, making sure that we've got the right value drivers and way of doing it. And then for delivery, I would be looking at packages clearly. Um, yeah, we all know about 10 lessons for X, but actually I would be looking at expanding that a little bit further and um, possibly taking a lesson from um, you know pilot classes, for example, where it's, um, it is a package of 25 hours, you know, look, looking at a bigger package that can be split over time. Yeah, I think that um, I would largely agree with what you've said there. And there's obviously always the exceptions elsewhere. But, and, uh, and Terry, can I just make a huge caveat? It's yeah. been a long time since I bought driving lessons. <laughs> <laughs> but, this, it's, but that kind of amplifies the point in that it's an industry that's still the same. You know, it's, it's still the same principle behind it. The, the, you learn to drive. Now, yes, we are trying to, to teach in different ways. You know, we're trying to bring in a more of a, a coaching method around teaching rather than sitting here telling you what to do so that when you pass your test, you're actually able to problem solve rather than, you know, when you'll hear people say, uh, oh, you learn to drive properly once you've passed your test. Well, we try to remove that now and actually get it so you learn to drive on lessons and you can apply that afterwards so that we're trying to change things i think that yeah i largely agree with what you're saying and, and we, you kind of brought me on to my next question in a way where you very much talking about uh, almost working and looking for niches there and i mentioned before about my average age of students being 27 and that was completely accidental for me and that fell about because when I left the, the national school I was with, I was with Red Driving School. Um, when I left them, I needed to start bringing my own custom in. And the way I did it, and again, it was just for experimentation, but I started doing videos on, on Facebook, just talking and doing live videos and having people come and ask me questions. And I found that by doing that, for some reason, it was that, that 27-year-old, often females, that gravitated towards towards that so i almost accidentally found my niche there um but that's something i think you were talking about in in Bossett as well it's about finding that that target audience that avatar um what advice or tips would you give us on 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 working towards that yeah so this is this is vitally important for all businesses not not just driving schools but i i think with driving schools having that clearly defined avatar can really set you apart from the you know the mainstream and there is some some concerns about this as well. But if you're marketing to everyone, you're marketing to no one. That's a fundamental issue that you've got in the, you know, if you are just trying to advertise to the mass market, it's not really going to be resonating with anyone in particular. And often, I mean, before I go into how you design the avatar, I think it's worth just covering off the potential objections that people have. Um, Because I want people to listen to what I'm saying rather than having these objections sat in their mind. The objection is, well, if you're marketing to 31-year-old ladies who who live in a certain postcode and drink a certain drink and eat certain food and blah, 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 you're narrowing it down so much you're excluding everyone else. And you're not. You're not excluding anyone else because you're not going to turn away someone who's 32 or 29 or who is male or um, who drinks a different color drink. You know, you're not you're not going to be turning away people. What you're doing is you're creating the design of who it is you want to work with and then working around that. So you're creating a base for you to target and the conversion rate that you have is much higher because your messaging is consistent and your service delivery is consistent. So how do you go about doing this? 
really simply, you've got to get into the mind of your customer. And you do that by designing this picture, which we call an avatar. And you design what they look like, what they're interested in, how they make their buying decisions. So in my book, I go through a load of questions that you should ask yourself. And they they range from the obvious, i.e. how much do they want to spend on driving lessons, to the not so obvious. What handbag would they be wearing? Where would they go on holiday? And it's all about trying to understand the way that they make decisions and the way that they decide to spend their money, who they spend their money with. So, you know, a, a perfectly valid question could be what supermarket do they shop at? And by doing this, what it does is it allows you to build that clear picture of how they make their decisions. And then the magic happened because you find out where to place your adverts. So, for example, if you're after a certain um, subset of people, you know, and it might be that, I don't know, for example, I live in West Berkshire and there's, um, there's quite a bit, around, around this area, there's quite a big um, horse community in a town called Lambourne. So I, I live fairly, fairly close to Lambourne. There's a big horse riding community. It's, you know, it's second to Newmarket. And if I was to say, look, the, the typical Lambourne resident is my typical customer. Then where do I go and market? There's probably much more cost effective routes of marketing than just the local newspaper. I could I could be um, marketing through the places that they go. I could be marketing at the stables. I could be looking at newsletters, all of that kind of stuff. So I could um, I can target my marketing more effectively. Secondly, I can then target my messaging. So I could actually focus my messaging based on the stuff that they find um, attractive, that they find compelling. Now, I'm not in the horse world. I wouldn't have a clue. So, Terry, don't ask me any questions on <laughs> what I'd put in that advert. On the flip side, just yeah, same distance the other way is a town called Hungerford. And Hungerford is known as being the town of antiques and grannies. So if I was looking to advertise driving lessons in Hungerford, the likelihood is that the first thing that I would do is look at the local demographic. Do I want to work with that demographic? But I'm probably going to be aiming at single ladies who who maybe have been in a relationship. Um, you know, they may be widowers. Uh, they might possibly never have driven themselves in their life. It, you know, it's a fairly affluent area. Um, they they might be in unfortunate circumstances now and have decided they want to get a life skill. Again, my messaging will be completely different. But the important thing is that that specific messaging that I put out will attract a radius around for people that I'm marketing to as well. So whilst I will attract the person that I'm aiming for, I will attract the people similar to them, but not exactly the same. But when they speak to me, they're far more likely to convert. Yeah. And I think that brings us back to kind of a point we made earlier about uh, self-employed in your own businesses and why. I think one of the key drivers is always going to be, you know, you want to make yourself happy for whatever reason. And one thing I found, uh, and again, this is purely accidental on my part, although I'll do it intentionally now, was these people coming to me because I was marketing myself a certain way are the people I want to work with. Mm. So now mm. I'm just working with people I actually genuinely enjoy working with, which yes. just makes life better and happier. Um, Comple- completely. So it allows you to choose who you want to work with. Um, your pricing forms part of that positioning as well. You know, if you price yourself, I, I, I really don't know what the going rates are, Terry, so please excuse me. I'm going to assume 30 quid an hour just as a that's, that's a complete guess, but I've got no idea. So correct me if I'm wrong. But if you want to work higher end, you can you can tweak that through pricing. If you want to work lower end, you can tweak it through pricing. So you you, you find that by defining who it is you want, you you can then adjust what you do to become more attractive to to attract the kinds of people you want to work with, and that's the beauty of self employment. You can choose who you're working for each and every day. Yeah, and and just to give you a a compliment there, I think you made a good guess there at that price because yes, there's the extremes both ways, but in my experience, that seems to be a at least where I am, uh, sort of Bradford, that seems to be a good middle ground that that thirty pound now. So yeah, good guess. Um, yeah, so moving on to, to speaking about you and your book and your podcast, uh, as I go through your book, there's some brilliant analogies in there and examples. And the one that really resonated with me was the, the one about the crystal balls and the rubber balls. And I don't know why that clicked with me, but it really did. And it was, it's like my 
my wife is quite ill, so I need to look after her. And it's just like, right, she's a crystal ball. I can't drop that. Because if I drop that, something bad's going to happen. Whereas, you know, me, I can't think of the other example, but the rubber ball, I can drop that. That's not end of the world. That'll bounce back. But that that crystal ball, I need to look after. And like I said, that that really resonated with me. Is could you just expand on that a touch for me? Because that that really clicked for me. Yeah, of course. No, and thank you for saying it clearly. So I heard it from somewhere. You know, most of the stuff I talk about, I've heard from different places. And the stuff that clicks with me is the stuff that I tend to share. Um, but I found the crystal ball rubber ball analogy a really good way to think about what is it that's important. What do you absolutely need to protect? And what is it that you don't need to lose too much sleep over? Because the problem we have as business owners is that we tend to be distracted by the urgent rather than the important. And we tend to be distracted by the present rather than the distant. So, for example, if you, um, I, I don't know, if you owe somebody locally 50 quid and you owe the tax man 50 grand, and the tax man's not writing to you, but the lady you owe 50 quid's knocking on your door every single day. They're ringing your phone 10 times a day. Which one are you going to deal with? You're going to you're going to get rid of a squeaky wheel, aren't you? You're going to um, yeah, you're going to solve the problem that's the noisiest. The challenge you have is that the noisiest problem isn't possibly the biggest problem, isn't possibly the most important problem. So it's a really important mindset to have to focus on what's important and both positively and negatively to be able to prioritize where you put your attention, um, what you protect and what you wrap up in cotton wool and what you allow to drop if you absolutely have to. Now, that's not saying that you drop it because the analogy is like juggling. You know, ideally, you want to keep all of the balls in the air. But if you have to drop some then make sure you drop the ones that aren't so important. So for driving instructors, clearly there are some um, sacred crystal balls that cannot be dropped in terms of how you conduct yourself, in terms of you know, not, not drinking two pints of vodka before going in the car. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a number of things that you cannot do. They are crystal balls and your reputation is shot if you break one of those crystal balls. On the other hand, there will be things in your business that are rubber balls. And sometimes they can be positive rubber balls as well. But actually, they're trimmings that aren't really important, but you perhaps perceive they are. So I guess that analogy is really a way of asking people to take a step back, to look at what's important in their life, to take a look at what's important in their business, you know, if, if a business owner is having sleepless nights and too many business owners have sleepless nights, doing what um, corporates would call a risk register, dumping everything down on paper, looking at, you know, scoring them from one to 10. What's the financial impact? What's the likelihood? And it will give you an idea of what stuff you really should focus on and what stuff actually isn't important. But that prioritization is key to having a clear mind. And without a clear mind, you can't have a clear business. Yeah, it just resonated for me. I was, and this actually ties in with my next question. I was listening to that on an on audiobook version uh, while I was walking the other day. And it was it was one that I had to pause the audiobook after because it got me thinking. Um, and it, yeah, it really, I don't know why that one clicked so much, but it worked. But that comes into sort of my next question, and this is just purely curiosity for me. Uh, we are podcast. You that that's you that does the podcast. That's you that narrates it. That, that that's all you. With the the Bossit book, you obviously you wrote that book, but you didn't narrate that. Now, just for my curiosity, what was the reason for not narrating your own book when you do your own podcast? <laughs> Amazing question, and there's a couple of answers to this. So the first answer is my cock-up. Um, it's always important to read contracts and to know what you can negotiate in contracts. And I did not negotiate the clause around audiobooks in my contract. So I understand now, um, and I should be an expert in publishing contracts because I've had three of them, but I understand now that you are able to, and publishers are willing to, release the audiobook rights to the author. So I wasn't aware of that at the time. 
And I also wasn't aware that if they were to produce an audio book, I, I mean, I presumed that I would just be asked to narrate it, but I wasn't. So, that, yeah, that, the first answer was my cock up. Um, and I guess it's refreshing for people to admit their cock up. Second issue, when the book rights were sold, so they were sold separately to the book itself. So the book has been, um, it's been sold internationally. It's been translated into Russian sold in the US, India, and a few other places. Um, but the audiobook rights were sold after the print rights. However, they were sold during COVID. And there was an opportunity, had business been as usual, for me to travel over to the US and record it for the US publishers. It would have cost me, you know, 300 quid flights and, um, you know, and a bit of time, but I would have been able to do it. And, Terry, if I'm honest, I wish I had, because I think my voice is a strong part of my brand. Unfortunately, with COVID, no one can get into the US. So I was unable to get into the audiobook publishers to read it. So, so there, there's a couple of reasons, um, but primarily it all comes down to my cock up in the contract. Nothing endears me more towards someone than when they admit making a mistake. I think it's something that people we don't do enough. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, but I, I'm, I am, I am a collection of mistakes. <laughs> Are you not the only one? I'm sure. Um, yeah. So the so the book and the podcast. Just uh, tell me a little bit about. I'll tell the listeners, I suppose, a little bit about those why they should be listening or reading in the book's case, and um, if and why it's relevant to driving instructors. Yeah, of course. So. The book came about because, I mean, I'd written two books before. I'd written The Startup Coach and The Franchising Handbook. And The Startup Coach was what's known as a series book. So without wanting to bore your listeners too much about the intricacies of a publishing world, for nonfiction books, you've got two types of books. You've got a series book, which is, it looks the same as five or six other books. It has the same format, it has the same layout, and most importantly, has the same tone of voice. And then there's a standalone book, which is the kind of book that we normally think about. You know, you go into WH Smith and you see it on its own. The series books tend to be on floor four of Waterstones, and they look the same as five or six others. Possibly the most well-known example is the For Dummies series. Yeah. So if you've ever seen a For Dummies book, the big yellow ones, you know, they've all got the same style. They're all a bit quirky. They've got the images and so on. So the Startup Coach was a series book. And the problem with that was that instead of being Carl, I had to be professional Carl who was speaking in the tone of voice of the series, um, even so far as word count, number of exercises and so on. So Bossit was actually the book that I wanted to write in the first instance, but with a whole lot more experience. And I really wrote it, it and it was um, mentioned in the dedication, but it's written to my kids because I genuinely believe that the next generation will have a much tougher time in the workplace than we've had. And I think we've had a much tougher time than the generation before us. You know, I know, I, I know it's fashionable to blame the boomers for everything that's wrong in the world, but, you know, the, the mentality of those 20, 30 years older than us is a safe nine to five job for life. The mentality of, you know, my age, I'm, I'm an early millennial. The mentality is that you want a, a career and a focus, but you might have to change job along the way. I believe the mentality of the next generation who are still at school is going to be that they will need to do what they need to do to earn a living. And I think that will be um, encompassing self-employment far more than it does at the moment. So I wanted to write the book to really help that next generation. And yeah, that, that was the intention. But it seems to have resonated. You know, a, a lot of small businesses, both new and existing small businesses, have found it useful. The podcast is a little bit different. So, Terry, the podcast was originally an interview series. However, COVID put paid to that. Um, it was studio based. And there were sponsors and so on and so forth. And we had some wonderful guests, you know, the kind of guests that you could never imagine. However, when COVID hit, it was impossible to get to the studio. It was impossible to renew the sponsorship, et cetera, et cetera. So it's now just a repository for my voice notes. I think that's the best way of putting it. If I if I have an experience or a random fault, you know what? I'll spark up a podcast and record it, get it out there. And I just see it now as a bit of brain food for anyone who wants to um, while away 15, 20 minutes, half an hour on a tube journey. 
Well, it's uh, it's on my list of, of of listens, and I'm very selective in my audio. So I realize I'm giving you a lot of praise today. So I'll have to find someone to complain about in a minute, I think. But um, but yeah, I, I appreciate that. And and like I said, uh, anyone that's listening, I, I I recommend the podcast. So I definitely recommend the book. Uh, and I, it's one of those books where I tend to listen to audio books, um, and then decide if I want to read the book. Because with the audiobook, I tend to often just get a, a general message from the book rather than the specifics. But if I come away wanting more, that's when I go buy the book as an actual book, if you like, and then put into action the specifics. And I will be buying this as the, the proper book to action it more. Sure. Does that make sense? In my head, that makes sense. Um, okay, cool. So uh, I've taken up enough of your time today. I really appreciate you joining us. I'm just going to ask you for a few final pieces before we disappear. First of all, if you could leave my audience, so that's driving instructors and generally sort of small business owners, with one final piece of advice to take away, what, what piece of advice would you offer? Do what's right for you. I think that that's probably more relevant for driving instructors than any other advice that I can give. Um, I think that, as you've said, it's an industry that hasn't changed much. And I think it's an industry with a whole host of stereotypes about the way you should do things, the way you should position yourself, et cetera, et cetera. Do what feels right for you. And you will find that whilst it might not make you a millionaire, it will make you enjoy the process. Excellent. And another thing I'm asking everyone on this series is for a book recommendation. If you were to give us one book to take away that we can go away and learn from, what book would you suggest? Listen, of course, I'm going to say my own book, Boss It. However, um, I think that's a bit of a cop out because you've already suggested it. So I'm going to um, share another book that was um, transformative for, for my mindset. And I think that it's just a thoroughly good read. And that is Before Our Work Week by a guy called Tim Ferriss. Um, it's a phenomenal book because what it did was it really challenged my perceptions and understanding of what society should be. And it was the first book that made me realize that actually I don't need to work from nine till five. I don't need to be the one doing the graft. I don't need to be the one rolling my sleeves up, et cetera, et cetera. And for a typical driving instructor, I think the book would be really useful in helping them Take a step back from what they're doing, find the dissatisfaction, because I think it will naturally surface, and then work out strategies to address it. So I think that would be a really strong book. And Terry, if you don't mind, I'm just going to suggest a couple of others as well, because um, yeah, I might as well share the, I, I guess, the accumulated knowledge of books that I've had along the way. Um, I think that a really strong book for anyone who wants to dive deeper into the difference between employment, self-employment and business ownership would be a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, personal finance book, because um, let, let's be honest, as a driving instructor, you're only as good as your last month and then you're only as good as your tax bill. Um, Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson is a phenomenal book. If you want to improve your sales skills, I'd be looking at How to Sell Anything to Anyone by Joe Girard. There's, there's hundreds of books out there that are great. You probably noticed that the trend is I'm suggesting the, I guess, the old school business books. And you know what? They're the ones that tend to work. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that. You know, the, there's a reason a lot of these are still bestsellers now, um, whereas a lot of new books that come out will dip into the charts and disappear. Mm. Um, okay, cool. So just to wrap up then, um, where can people find you? Is there anything you want to promote? Yeah, sure. So look, the easiest thing would be just to mention my social media. I'm, I'm fairly prominent on most social media platforms. If you just search for my name, um, Carl Reader, so that's C-A-R-L-R-E-A-D-E-R, um, you'll find me on all of the social platforms from Twitter to TikTok. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time today, Carl. I'll make sure all those are in the show notes as well, so people can just go and click on them. Really appreciate you joining me today. It's been brilliant. Thank you so much, Terry. It's been an absolute pleasure. So again, a big thank you to Carl Reader for joining us. Uh, um, really great picking his brain. He's someone I've only come across quite recently. Um, but he, I've picked up a lot just from listening to his podcast and reading his books. So make sure you go check those out as well. You'll also notice other on the show, we spoke about England um, in the, I think it went in the semifinals. Um, yeah, that didn't go quite as planned, did it? Either way, it, it was a good tournament. 
So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what's coming up on the show going forward. Every week, we're going to have a bonus episode where I'm speaking to other instructors about the latest news and goings on within the industry. That'll be released every Wednesday as a separate episode. And going forward, that's just going to be a short 10-minute segment. To gain the full episode, you'll have to go check us out over on Patreon. Now, at Patreon, you can support the show. There's a variety of ways you can do that over there. So go take a look where you can get access to things like the Green Room episode. You can get access to Tez Talks, Masterminds, and even a show we're working on at the minute called ContraFlow conversations there's going to be a whole lot of stuff going up so make sure you go check it out just go find patreon and search for the instructor or you can find the links in the show notes or on all my social media but for now take care the instructor podcast with terry cook talking with leaders innovators experts and game changers about what drives them now if you've been listening to the previous shows, you'll have heard that at the end of every episode, after the end credits have rolled and all that kind of stuff, just having a little bonus segment where I'm asking the guests some quick fire questions. However, I didn't do that with Carl Reader because I hadn't devised this segment at the time. So instead, I'm going to give you mine. So I'll ask myself the questions and give you the answers. So the questions I ask, I guess, are dog or cat? For me, it's a dog. If you've seen my Instagram feed or my Facebook feed, you'll know I've got an awesome dog called Cassia, who I refer to as Mega Dog. My favourite book all time, I'm allowing myself to cheat on this one because I don't have a favourite book. I have a favourite series of books. It's the Dark Tower series by Stephen King. Would I consider going vegan? Well, I am. Just over a year now. Not being perfect, but I'm doing all right. My favourite film of all time? Jaws. Great film ever. No debate there. What do I refer to my students as? Um, students, really. Sometimes learners. I could call them a mixture of stuff. Uh, probably not one thing, but either students or learners. My proudest achievement is actually this podcast. Probably all three. I've got three. I've got the instructor. I've got the five-minute theory, and I've got driving test tales. And it's probably having the confidence and the ability to go and release this. It is a proud moment. And then my favorite, oh, sorry, my, my life goal, my one life goal I've got remaining. I hate to bring it back to this, but it's this podcast again. I want to bring, um, and it's what I'm using Patreon for, I want to bring content to instructors and small business owners that they can take away, that they can use to develop. I want a safe space for instructors to come where they can bring their problems, where they can bring their concerns, where they can learn. I want this to be the place where people come that want to become game changers, that want to become experts, that want to lead. I want the curious people, the people that are looking over there and thinking, hmm, what's all that about? That looks scary. I want to go and learn that. I want this place to be for those people. It's a big goal, big goal, but I reckon we can do it. My goal for August, I want one Patreon subscriber in August. You'll see me very happy if I achieve that.